this is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice before I start. If you ever wanna make a talk or submit a talk for RubyConf, do not submit a talk for something that you either have never done or uh, it's very unlikely you'll do by the time RubyConf gets around because that's gonna just kill you when it, like, with the whole imposter syndrome thing. Uh, like I was up really late like uh, freaking out yesterday. But to deal with that because I have a bunch of people and I can, I can like um, suede you. I brought chocolates. So if you, if you hate this talk, you can come to me afterwards. I can give you chocolate and you'll feel awesome about this talk and like actually showing up. Uh, and oh yes, okay, so there's two types. There's French chocolates, which will go amazing with the coffee over there. Um, and there's Icelandic chocolate and the brand, I, I wish we had like, the brand is called Omnom. I'm not shitting you, this is the brand. <laughs> Just for that, go to Iceland, because it's totally worth it. Uh, also, if you ask me a good question, I, could, I might throw a chocolate. Um, so this talk is called Polishing Ruby, and the subtitle kind of is it's hinting at the idea of what I mean by polishing Ruby. Um, the idea is to basically together, even if you're someone who's not confident, we're gonna kinda go through kinda like my experience not being confident with Ruby. And the question I wanna ask every single one of you in this room is, why are you here? It feels great in technique, like practice this thing, but it's actually hard to manage. Um, so the, the idea is like, why are you here at RubyConf, sitting there listening to people talk about Ruby, it's probably because some, at some level you kind of care about Ruby, I hope. Uh, and what I want you, like what I want to try to exercise with you is to prove that. If you do care about Ruby, you should maybe try to think about a, finding a way to leave it better than how you found it maybe a few years ago or maybe just now. If you have any ideas, Nobody's asking you to change the world. We're not asking you to, to, to revolutionize the garbage collector. Like, that's not your job, necessarily. There's someone who's really good at that. Um, but you can add to it. So you can, you can add to it in a meaningful way, and I don't mean like that. Like, don't do that. It's just like plus ones on repos and stuff like that. That's not necessarily how you add to it. But you can add to it by just a little bit changing it and not, not changing it, but adding something without meaning to, like, you don't want to change everything that's ever happened. So just, you know, take the world as it is right now and just increase the, the coolness of it by a little bit. My name is Olivier. This is how you say that. Olivier! <laughs> and you feel happy at the end. Uh, I am not a Satanist, uh, for real. I, I promise you this is the show Silicon Valley. You don't have to watch this, but everybody on Twitter is like super, super excited about telling me how much I look like this guy. Um, <laughs> but I am not a Satanist, and I really hope I don't get smitten. Is that how you smoten? How, you, how do you conjugate this? Smiten? Smoten, see, there you go. We have a, we're gonna talk about language, so. I, uh, I work for Code School, and so we teach people a bunch of things like uh, Ruby, Rails, uh, so if you like these things, we have amazing stickers. There's Katie and Joel over here that have a bunch of really awesome stickers. We don't have shirts anymore, sadly. And recently I worked on making an API for an iOS app. And I, my, I had made APIs before, but not APIs that would create a lot of havoc if they didn't work. So I made it with Ruby, and I made it with Rails, and crazily, I even wrote tests for it. Uh, Thank you. Not test driven. Um, the, the reason I wrote tests is because what if someone, especially me, changes the API later and it breaks the app and I don't realize it until someone just says like, oh, it's not loading the right thing. So I was really, really scared of this. Uh, just like I was scared that I would forget my pants this morning. Like, this is the worst fears. So I thought, okay, let's write some integration tests and then we can go have ice cream and I'll liberate you. You can go have lunch. So given a user, if I ask the user API for something, I should receive information about data about this user. So something like this, you have a user that you create with a factory or a fixture, you call the user API for that only user that exists because you just made it, and then you parse that response. And then with RSpec, if you use RSpec, you can do expect data to include the name Olivier, which is my name, it's super, still hard to pronounce. Um, so RSpec says, that's awesome, that works, this is cool, let's go have ice cream. Uh, 
And then I just had this moment when I was building this API where I was like, can I do that in Ruby? Can I ask a hash, do you include another hash, perchance? Let's try. So you take the same response that's an object that's been parsed, and you ask, I don't know, the first thing that came to mind because of RSpec was maybe blame RSpec was include. Okay, so do you include this other hash that's, you know, similar? And no, it doesn't because that's not what this method is for. So our spec is neat and it kind of like gets what I want to do. But, and so it has this matcher called include right there. And I was wondering, okay, so if there's a thing called include in our spec and a thing called include in Ruby or for the, the hash include, what's the difference there? Like what is this include matcher doing that the include method is not doing or am I misunderstanding this whole thing? So I just looked into it. So there's this matcher, and inside of it, it's checking when, it, when you're doing a match on a hash, it's checking to see if you're comparing the hash with a subset. And then internally, so it does this thing, and then it checks whether the two things that you're comparing are a hash, and then if you're a hash and I'm a hash, let's dance. You, we're gonna actually compare things and I'll tell you if it's true or not, if you are included in the other thing. Uh, it's really good, and actually after that it does an actual hash include, so it actually does the simple thing that Ruby does um, with a key and a value. It's great. And it only, the only thing is that, yeah, it's very simple, it just does the, the, the check there, and as long as your value for this key is the same as my value for this key, it's gonna be true. Which is, for my API, I really wanna make sure that these keys and values match, and not just the keys and not just the values on one side. And I'm lazy, so I want it to work that way, and it makes sense. So warning, though, uh, this only works for one level. You can't have a nested hash in our spec. It won't work. It won't figure out, like, where in the nested hash it's going to be better. So back to hash. How does hash include work? Because it doesn't work how I somehow thought it would work. Uh, it's not as neat as our spec, but it's, it's still kind of cool. It makes sense. So you have a hash. A true, B false, another hash, A true, and you ask the first hash whether it includes Y. And it's gonna say false because it basically has key. So it's not checking for anything fancy inside of your hash or whether it includes it or not. It's an alias to, all these things are the same actually. It's include has key, member key, if you don't like the has thing, uh, that's actually how it's named in, C in CRuby, but I find that weird, but I don't know this much about Ruby, I can't really have crazy opinions. Turns out we value keys over values. Nobody? Uh, poor values are going to feel devalued <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, so they kind of like, okay, so I, they made me grasp for this, this thing, because we like rules, so like if a necessary feature has a high astonishment factor, it may be necessary to redesign the feature. But then uh, can't ask the Ruby core team to redesign a feature because it rubs me the wrong way probably a terrible idea. So is hash include astonishing if I compare it to, say, string include, um, which works the way I expect it, because I'm lucky, it, you know, if you ask it for the same string, it's a substring of itself, so this is totally fine. If, but if you do that on array include, it's not gonna work exactly the same way either. You can't ask uh, an array if it contains itself. So it's, it's a little astonishing to me, but just to me, probably. So I tweeted about it because that's the first thing that happens when I have a thought. I just put it on Twitter. Uh, if you follow me, I'm sorry. Um, so I said, okay, I don't understand why it works that way and it's an alias to key when it should check for a subhash. In my mind, it should check for a subhash, just linguistically, probably not an adverb, but. Um, so maybe I can do something about it. So I thought about, okay, so I'm gonna write down what I mean and not just in a tweet so that other people can tell me this is completely crazy, stop, now. And they did, that was awesome. So Pat Shaughnessy was like, yeah, no, I expect a key, check, not what you think. And Terrence was like, no, please don't do this. And everybody else. Um, so my, my, my first lesson doing this, like a little deep dive, was my expectations and surprises are not necessarily universal. Like what, what surprises me as someone who's not coming from computer science, because I'm not, uh, are different from what language implementers and people come from computer science expect. And, and also nobody wants to break the API. So like that's a thing, like 
Very important thing, if you're ever gonna try to do something with Ruby, don't do things that break APIs, because that's just, no. Uh, but then I got some, some hope from Pat. He was like, hey, what about a new method name? Maybe. And that was like, oh, okay, yes. Maybe I can do something. Maybe I can have this thing, and maybe it makes sense, and other people are gonna agree. So that's the simple question I wanna ask is, does this hash contain this other hash? So maybe it should be called hash contain. That seems to make sense, and a bunch of people agreed. Um, so this is how it would work, pretty much exactly the same as the original one. Wouldn't that be nice? Or it could be subhash. I think a bunch of people were, when we were talking, were like, this is kind of like the subset method on the set, uh, which is kind of cool, it checks for that. And then while we were talking about this, and I'm just talking to just a few people, just like make sure I'm not completely insane, <laughs> this happens. This person, thanks to Terrence actually. Uh, before I'm even done, like, figuring out if the name actually makes sense, Nobu made a patch. Like, I don't even understand how that works. Like, I knew he was called Patch Monster, but I shit you not, I just wrote a gist and a blog post, and he had a patch for it. <laughs> yes, you had to talk to him, but that's still kind of crazy. You just mentioned it, right? Yeah. Mentioned it in passing. Uh, this is the patch. It's on GitHub. He just put it up on GitHub. And what's awesome about this patch is that if you are like me, completely illiterate when it comes to C, you can see, well, you can't see on this slide because it's a lot, of, a lot of more, but this is actually not a big patch. It's like 20 lines, something like that, 20, 30 lines, and there's just very simple things going on, and you realize that's act the thing I'm dreaming of <laughs> uh, can be real without that much crazy effort. And that's kind of, whew, feels awesome. So thank you, Nobu. I don't know if you're here. Someone in the hallway. Holy shit, thank you. <laughs> so that's. So you, you don't need to know C to contribute to Ruby. It's good to be aware of it like, like I am now because of the way I've seen how he, he's implemented that patch. Um, and also there are many good humans like him like him, like him, so that's Terrence, Zach, Nobu, uh, and, and so many others, that will help you, even when you're fumbling and you're really, your argument's not solid yet, because it's totally not solid. So what now? Um, so this is the second part of the talk. This is the part where actionable things are discussed. So I'm sorry with the boring like stuff, now it's getting into serious stuff. So the second part is bugs.rubylang.org. Like, just like, memorize that as a litany you're just, you're just gonna have to go there. This is the Ruby issue tracking system. It's a little verbose and not the best CSS uh, that you'll ever see. Um, and there's a lot of wikis, and they're a little messy, but they're really, really, really helpful. Um, one of the most helpful ones is these, this little four developers one, and there's this thing called how to request features. So if you're, if you're uh, pedantic, uh, crazy, ambitious, and OCD, then you're probably one of those people who are gonna think, oh, I can add something. Um, so one of the, the first thing that you have to think about is, is this thing that I wanna add to Ruby a, a meaningful improvement? That's kind of a vague thing, but here's how I broke it down. Before, my thing, to iterate over a hash, you had to iterate over a hash or use the side effect of another method, the merge method, hash merge, to achieve the expected result that I, that I expected. So like, make sure that, are you inside of you? Uh, after, you can ask a hash if it contains another hash, and it's just gonna tell you. And it's expressive, it's not surprising, it makes sense. Um, now, the second criteria is, uh, is this a new request? So is, is this something that someone's actually submitted before? Could you please look so that you don't repeat the same thing that somebody's already asked and we turned them down and there was a good reason. So I searched and I found 11 results for this weird query that I, that I had and there was, there was actually one pretty, pretty similar feature request to extend hash include in order to be able to, I think check for, I think pass multiple arguments or something like that. It was, it was basic as you could pass a okay, two arguments, a key and a value, uh, and the way it was done was interesting. It wasn't actually breaking the API, which is kind of cool, which is the thing that would actually prevent people from going, no. Uh, but it's not exactly what I wanted to do, and it's not exactly the same scope or use case. So I think like this, this will work out. 
and the issue was a year old and hasn't been followed upon after people from the core team like ask a bunch of you know, questions, other people were like, can you clarify this and that? So the third criteria is can it be done any other way? So if there's a way, so I told you about hash merge and that's a way to, to achieve the same result and that's how I implemented my thing originally in Ruby, but just, okay, how can I hack this in Ruby? Um, yes, it exists. It's either verbose uh, or if you loop over the hash or it's inexpressive because why would you merge a hash to figure out? It just doesn't make sense. It's like you, you have to take a detour. Um, then there's also, would it benefit many people? So I thought, okay, I found this method, this include method in RSpec, and this, this is where the, the, the idea of it came about. What about RSpec? Like, how many people use RSpec? A lot of people. Like 20, 21 million downloads for all versions, and then like half a million for this version which is kind of crazy, and that's just the RSpec expectation gem which gets included in RSpec. So it seems like it could benefit people because people are using it and expecting it to work, at least in this library. Is it a good name? Well, if you ask the question, does a hash contain another hash, and the method is called hash contain, I think it's a good name. Uh, of course, like, of course there's microphone slide. Of course there's people who might disagree. Um, but I think so. Now, what does the method accept as arguments? A hash. What is the return value? A Boolean. Are there any risks of incompatibility? No, because it's a brand new method and I'm not actually changing anything existing. Um, I, think, I think that's fine. And then finally, one of the criteria is write, write it down. So this was the implementation that I mentioned. This was my super naive implementation that just did the merges as, as a side effect of the merge. You could figure out uh, whether it's included or not. Um, but of course, no boost patch is better, probably faster. Um, and finally, you have to make a concise but complete proposal, which is the part that I think is the most terrifying because you've formulated these ideas maybe on Twitter or to friends or to people at conferences. You're like, it would be great if this was like that. And then you actually have to do this thing. So you have to go to the, the issue tracker and you have to fill out, oh, I have a laser, I forgot. Pew. Mine, is, mine is red, so much better. Uh, yeah, you, uh, this is a very important part. There's a thing in English. You don't have to know Japanese to submit an issue. This has been going on for a while, but there's still people who don't understand this and they're still worried about that to submit their issue. The only important thing is that, is that in your description or in your explanation of your request, you include code that makes it explicit to anybody involved what you're talking about, which is exactly what I'm not doing here, so don't do that. Um, and then I think the other thing that I did was, yeah, make sure the title is, is clear and then you're not just rambling in the title. So I think I try to make it as clear as possible. Use this to check whether something contains a hash. And that's about it. This is not a finished thing. I actually haven't done this. It's in my browser right now. And I think I might actually submit it at the end of this talk if, if nobody like, tries to tackle me in the meantime. Uh, so I'm still working on it. And finally, the final thing, finally the final thing, yeah. Follow through. So you remember that thing that I mentioned where someone had opened an issue similar like that? So a few people gave feedback, but they, the author of the feature request didn't really come back to say, oh, okay, sure, I'll, I'll change this thing, this request to assess for that. So following through, making sure you're responding when people actually take the time, especially from the core team, to respond to you is very important. So I will do that, I promise. So I'm gonna rewind really quick to the first step. Because I have opinions and you're not necessarily someone like me who just like finds a thing and I'm like, oh, it should work this way, brah. But you can find inspiration in other people's feature requests if you, if you're not like, if you don't have a strong will to change things or if you're just trying to learn how the things work in this issue tracker. So for instance, you can take Aaron Patterson's feature request for I think time elapsed, yeah. Uh, how he phrased it, how he titled it, the code that he included in there that might be meaningful to you. Uh, Charles Nutter, you could see how he made his own feature request. So those are people that are familiar with the process and to see how they do it when they're in familiar waters may make you feel better about your feature request because you'll be like, well, mine has the same amount of detail, so. Um, then there's documentation patches. So Zizek is right here. Zachary Scott, and 
there's this really great project, the Ruby documentation project, and in there, there are actually great steps for you if that seems like a crazy jump for you to just be a Ruby user and then change Ruby and add something to it. Uh, you can make it better documented. So, and I love this sentence, by the way. This was right, this is like waiting for me. Uh, existing documentation it could use some polish. Exactly. In form, in, in form of clearer descriptions and better examples. Examples being the, the, the things, like there's a lot of really quick sentences in the documentations, but not a lot of examples that are. So it's a great place to start if you, uh, <laughs> if you, if you don't know where to start, and if you're kind of intimidated, and there's a lot of really nice step-by-step -step guides on, on the site. And also, uh, Zach may face smush you if, if you do it, because he'll be super happy. Um, and so yeah, there's that little getting set up thing that actually is useful not just for documentation patches, because I learned a lot from that too. Uh, fork Ruby, which is on GitHub now, uh, and you know have it locally, et cetera. Um, then there's accepted features, and this is something that Zach mentioned to me yesterday. Uh, on the Ruby tracker, there's a custom query in the sidebar that you can click on that shows you the accepted features for the current um, major branch, I guess. And uh, in there, you could see the things that need action, and there's quite a few of them that are not assigned, so I don't know if, right. So those are need, need to be assigned. Uh, there's already a ton of them already assigned. So, um, and the ones that are not assigned, there's 159. So that's quite, quite enough for you to chew on. And of course, there are bugs. So the problem with bugs is that there are many people responsible for things in the Ruby core team. So I, I don't know if it's probably something a little more hairy to look at, maybe a good place to learn how people report bugs. So these are the unassigned bugs that you can also find in the Ruby tracker. Um, it sounds less fun, but fixing or learning or understanding bugs will probably help you kind of like get <sighs> situated. And of course, remember that although I spent a lot of time talking about feature requests because I was excited, uh, they're a tougher sell because you're adding things that people are going to have to maintain for you inside the Ruby core team. Uh, if you don't join the Ruby core team, that means somebody else is going to have to maintain this thing that you were like, I'm super excited about this. This is the greatest idea ever. And and then you just go and you never touch it and never fix it ever again, and they have to deal with it. So empathize with them and realize that somebody has to pick up your, your stuff. Speaking of maintainers, there's a really cool list of maintainers that you can find either on the wiki of that issue tracker or on the actual source uh, inside of Ruby doc. You can find, so there's one thing that I noticed that they might be, I don't know, they might be different lists. I'm not sure if they're like, Now, what's nice about this list is that you'd find who's responsible for what in the Ruby core team uh, and also the other libraries that are not uh, necessarily like standard lib and stuff like that. So if you, if you have a features proposal, say for Ostruct, and you think that it should work better if you had a say in it, you can go talk to uh, Marc-André and like find him on Twitter or find him somewhere and just talk to him. Or you can find someone that actually knows about this domain and this thing or has dealt with it before. So go talk to maintainers if you can before you do your, in a roundabout way, that's what I, I had the luck of doing through Terrence. Um, I should go talk to Terrence. Um, the, and the, remember that the core team is, is pretty damn busy. So if you can save them work by just talking to a human, a proxy of them or people who are knowledgeable on this topic that you've seen a blog post from or something like that, running your idea by them or running your suggestion by them will save, basically just distribute the load and help you get comfortable. And to get comfortable, there's also a bunch of resources. There's this really cool blog post that came out last week by PJ Haggerty about, so you decided to contribute to Ruby, which is like perfect. It's like exactly the place to go after this talk if you wanna learn more. There's uh, Terrence's amazing talk, Ruby and You, in which he talks about a lot of the uh, similar things, a lot of security things, and how the process works. And uh, this, this site called OmniRef that Tim Robertson over there puts up. So if, you, if you're super intimidated by C the same way that I am, you are not alone. And this is a great place to go because he's annotated a bunch of the, the trickiest part of the Ruby, Ruby library, and other people have too. You can discuss little things, you can ask questions to people about specific parts of the, and just last week somebody was, I think, reviewing the symbol, 
simple stuff in Ruby uh, and figured out that there was kind of a performance issue there or something that was weird about it. And then Matt's found out about it. And this was fixed, I think, within, what, a week or something like that after that? Right, simple comparison. So just because someone, so someone, I don't know, I don't know their name, sadly, I'm, I feel bad, uh, looked at this with a, a new set of eyes and was like, hmm, why is it like this? And I'm not suggesting that everybody go around and like poke at everything in Ruby and says like, why is it like this, why is it like this? But this person managed to improve the performance of Ruby just by looking at a thing with a brand new set of eyes. So you're not alone, and to prove that point, if you've never contributed anything, I made a, a survey yesterday, and if you haven't taken it yet, I would love you to take it. Um, and this is basically, there's a few questions about your experience as a Ruby developer, uh, if you're paid, if you have written a blog post and things like that, but really the core of it is this thing. Um, if you are intimidated by the idea of contributing to Ruby, why are you intimidated? Um, so there's, I don't, I don't know where to start, which I hope I kind of like reduced a little bit. I don't know C, which is not necessarily a problem, even though that's one of the, the biggest things. <laughs> People will figure out I don't know what I'm doing, which is exactly my problem, that's why it's checked. Uh, and other things like breaking other people's stuff. Um, so, and the results are really cool. So this was just, f just five minutes before the talk. 128 people submitted uh, answers to this. So, what, 41% of them were over five years. They, they've been using Ruby over five years ago, but that, it's kind of like, you know, a nice little, little even split between three, four, and one year ago. And more importantly, the breakdown of the reason why people are terrified of contributing to Ruby is really cool. I don't know where to start. Not anymore. There's also, I don't have time to work on this, which is a really good reason, in which case, when you're at a conference, maybe that's the space to kind of like talk about that. You have people around there that can help you, make it faster and easier for you, and save time on the ramp. Uh, I don't know C, we talked about that, also not, not a big deal. So really, basically, the big three reasons why people don't con like feel comfortable con contributing back to Ruby are fixable. So let's fix them. Uh, and if, if you haven't, so like I said, if I, you haven't submitted to this little survey, I think it's really cool to, to have a sense for why people are not doing something. So please do the, it's kind of a weird URL, but hopefully you can snap it and see it and go there. So to, to conclude with like grandiose talks and, and ideas, science needs to meet reality at some point before it becomes technology. And that's where you come in. You, there's the people who create something, who theorize about something conceptually, and then there's the real thing when you're using it. And your point of view matters. Every single one person that uses Ruby, your point of view matters, and how you feel about things, or you know, how you're excited or not so excited about certain features actually matters, and your help is needed. It's not, uh, it's not useless at all. So, uh, we have a more diverse community and it's getting more diverse and the more diverse it becomes, the better things can be challenged by perspectives that are not exactly the same. Uh, and that's how we make progress. So let's make this Ruby sparkle and thank you for caring. That's it. <laughs>